Hello and welcome. In the last two videos, we discussed in detail what are the common issues with the data, why data cleaning is so important, and what is the right order in which we should proceed with the data treatment. We discussed the common approaches to treat the outliers, and we also discussed the common approaches to treat the missing values. We also discussed why the column-centric treatment approaches, such as mean, median, and the quartile-based approaches might not be the best approaches as they often miss out on the entirety of the record. They only look at the column at a time. And we discuss why using algorithmic approaches might be more meaningful. Therefore, in today's video, we are going to perform this treatment together. Let's get started. And I'll show you the easiest way to get started without much of a hassle of doing any installation. All you need is a Google account. Just sign into your regular Gmail account and go to the Google search page, the search engine. And in the search engine, just type Google Colab, as you see on your screen right now. When you do this, it takes you to the search results, which must be something like this. All I would want you to do is click on Google Colab. It takes you to this kind of a page, and I would want you to click on a new notebook. It takes a while to come up with a page like this, which is nothing but your online Jupyter notebook. You don't need any additional package, any permission, any additional installation, and this is absolutely free. The best part about Google Colab is it is most up to date. So it often would not give you trouble with the packages and all that you need to update from time to time in a static installation. Another piece is Google Colab allows you to use the cloud-based resources. So you can imagine that your computer might not have a good graphics processing unit or tensor processing unit, but Google Colab allows you to access this free of cost over the cloud. While we'll not be needing it right now, but you can imagine that you have a lot more resources available free of cost. If you do a connect here, you can see that it has allocated you around 12 gigabytes of RAM and 68 gigabytes of disk. There's a possibility that you do not have such a good configuration on your machine right now, but you can conveniently do it online live. And that too, with no hassle, just need to be signed into your Google account and you're here, right? So let's get started. And from time to time, feel free to keep pausing this video. If you think you're not able to catch up, you may pause. I will explain every single line of code that I'm going to type for you. By the end of this, if you stay patient, you'll definitely go back with some amount of learning. That's guaranteed. You may choose to name this file as something, so you may want to call it data preparation. And all of this work will be saved time to time by default. So when you access it again, it will be available online. You can access it through your drive as well. First off, to start with, we'll be calling some of the important libraries that we'll be using. And I'll keep giving you references as to where we are using what library. The first one is import numpy as np. Second is import pandas as pd. Third is import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. And then import seaborn as sns. Hit shift enter on your keyboard. It takes you to the next cell. Now we're going to read a data set because we want to do treatment of outliers and missing values with a proper data set. So I'm going to call a very popular data set, which if you're studying data science, you can't say that you've never heard about. So this data set is known as the Titanic data set and you don't have to have that on your machine locally. I'm going to call that using a function called load data set. So what I'm typing is SNS, which is the Seaborn package. It has a data set called Titanic. Please note this is all case sensitive. So if you type things in uppercase and lowercase and you do a mix match, other than what I'm typing, you might end up getting errors. You may pause this video from time to time, as I said, and keep executing it parallelly. It'll be fun. So it shows that right now we have created something called as a data frame, which is a typical row column format, as you've seen in spreadsheets of a data. And let's see how this looks like. So I'm going to do a df.head, which will show me the first five records of my data, right? So you have a typical row column kind of an arrangement. These are different features. This is a very popular data set available on different websites and different versions. Kaggle has been hosting a competition by the same name. Primarily, this is about predicting 
whether passengers on board Titanic in its maiden voyage would have or have not survived. To be able to assess this, you have certain features such as the passenger class, you have the gender, you have the age of the traveler, you have whether the passenger was traveling with a sibling or spouse, you have whether the passenger was traveling with parents or children, you have the fare that's paid, you have where the passenger embarked from, and there are certain redundant variables here, as we can see. Class, we already have the class here as three, two, one, and we have the same thing written here in alphabets. Gender is already there, and we have who, which is capturing it as man and woman. Uh, same way it has classified, looking at the age and a combination of gender into adult male, whether it's a true or a false. Deck is pretty similar to embarked, so not be adding much value. In fact, you see a lot of missing values here. Embarked town is the same as embarked. Alive is the same as survived. Just another way to write it. And alone. So if the passenger is traveling with, say, sibling, spouse, or parent, children, it would always be a false. If the passenger is neither traveling with sibling or spouse, nor traveling with parents or children, it will be a true. So this was a quick introduction to the data. We would not really need to get into too much of depth of these features because our motivation today is to treat the missing values and outliers, if any are present in this data. So let's just print the names of the columns here and I'll tell you why this will be handy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop all the columns that we don't need. And this can be done by doing df.drop and you can mention the name of the columns that you don't want. And in order to get this, you can simply copy the names from here. So from class onwards, we have redundant features, right? So I'm just copying this and now I have to drop the columns, so I'm going to write access is equal to one. And we can execute this. Now, if you check the head of the data frame again, you would have got rid of a few features, right? Those extra features have gone. We can quickly check the shape of the data frame if you want. And this is something that's achieved by doing df.shape. So we have 891 rows and eight columns. Now, it will be a good idea to visualize if we have outliers present in the data and if we have missing values present in the data. The best way to visualize outliers that we discussed earlier is through box plot. So let's just do this. I'm going to write plt dot figure. Figure size is equal to, let's say I do it a 12 by eight, just to get a bigger picture. And I am now typing df dot box plot. Now all of this is happening through matplotlib, which is a library that we call. The earlier portion that we just read or explored was to do with pandas. Let's just do df.boxplot and let me execute this. So when you do this, you get something like a memory location printed here. If you want to avoid this, you can just simply type plt.show so you will only get the plot printed. What is it that we interpret? We've discussed something similar in the previous video. When you do a box plot and the variables are on different scales, you often get some of the boxes as very compressed boxes. But whatever we see, it's good enough to figure out that we have columns containing outliers in our data. So we have to do an outlier treatment for these. So how do we go about treating outliers? We know that outliers are the values which are greater than Q3 plus 1.5 IQR or less than Q1 minus 1.5 IQR. In this case, right now, it looks like most of these values are the high-end outliers. First of all, I have four features where we have outliers, which means that I can go one by one and treat all the features, or I can act a little smart and define certain functions. When should you define functions? Well, if you have to do something repeatedly, it's always wise to define functions so that all of it can be performed with less of typing. So I'm going to define a function which is titled outlier limits. We know that a value becomes an outlier only if it is beyond a certain limit or below a certain limit. So we are defining a function which given an input column will be able to find the outlier limits, the upper limit and the lower limit. We are going to first of all find out the third quartile and the first quartile. And in order to do this, I'm going to call a numpy function that was another library that we imported initially, np.nan percentile. And you can see Google Colab is very smart. It's giving you recommendations parallelly all the time. What does it take as an input? I can type the name of the column, type the 75th 
and the 25th percentile here. This piece will estimate the 75th and the 25th percentile for us. Then there's something called as an interquartile range, which is the difference between the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. And then finally, we have the upper limit, which is Q3 plus 1.5 times the IQR, and the lower limit, which is Q1 minus 1.5 times the IQR. And we want this function to return the upper limit and the lower limit to us. So what is the advantage? See, for each column, if we wanted to give a proper treatment, we would have written this as many times as the number of affected columns. Is. But by defining the function, we'll simply pass the column reference here where column is written, and it will continue to give us the upper limit and the lower limit. We know that values above the upper limit and values below the lower limit are called outliers. So we first need to identify them and then find a suitable treatment for them. At this stage, we want to apply this function to the data and start with some treatment. Now, this is slightly unconventional. You have seen approaches where we go about replacing the outlier value with a median or we kind of cap it or floor it, which means you limit it to the upper limit that's called capping or flooring is limited to the lower limit. So if it's below the lower limit, you bring it there. In this approach, we are going to first convert the outlier value to missing values. Yes, you heard me right. We're going to convert the outlier values to missing values and we'll figure out how does this help in the long run. See, we've just defined a function which given an input gives us an output, but now we need to apply that function with the help of a loop so that it iterates over all the columns. So now we're going to call for column in df dot columns if df column dot data type is not equal to object. Now what is this object? Let me show you. When I check df dot info, we have our data as integers, floats, which are numerics, and the categorical data such as gender, which is male, female, and embarked, which is the embarked location as objects. The treatment that we are going to give is essentially meaningful for the numeric features, not the objects. So we will have to exclude the objects from this. I can delete the cell. Coming back, continuing with this, if it is not object, then what do we want it to do? We first want to get the upper limit and the lower limit using the function that we just defined. So earlier we defined a function and now we are applying that function through a loop. For any column in the list of columns that we have, we are saying if the data type of the column is not an object, which means it is actually a numerical column, calculate the upper and the lower limit above which, below which a value becomes an outlier respectively. So there is a function called np.fair. Wherever the value is greater than the upper limit or this pipe operator is actually an R symbol, which is mostly available above the enter key in most of the keyboards or df column is less than the lower limit, we want it to be replaced with a missing value. So I'm just writing np.nan. Nans are not a numbers. In Python, the missing values are denoted by nans. Otherwise, we want it to be left to what it was. So let's read this together. What is the condition we are applying? We are saying that wherever the value in a given column and the value of a cell in a given column, in fact, this is going to go over the entire data, so wherever for a given column, a value is greater than the upper limit or less than the lower limit, we want it to be replaced with a missing value. Otherwise, we want the value to be intact as is. Now, what this has done is that it has converted the existing outliers into missing values. And how do we go about checking the missing values here? Simply do df.info. So right now, do we have missing values in the data? It shows that we have our data, which is 891 rows from 0 to 890. So inclusive of 0, these are 891 records. But there are variables where you find lesser values, age for that matter, sibling, spouse, parents, children. Fair has a lot of missing values and there are a couple of missing values in Embark as well. In fact, there is a better way to check the exact count of missing values by the feature, by the columns. So that is called DF is null and you can do a sum. And if you execute this, you get the missing values by the feature, right? So there are columns where we don't have any missing value, but there are columns where we have many missing values. As a result of conversion of outliers to missing values, you've added more missing values to certain features, 
where there were no missing values. 